Good morning, good morning. Big Square, RoadDrew.com with your morning horn of Z's. Your sip of coffee that I already drank. Um, <clears throat> let's talk the Hunt Brothers. Uh, a lot of people comparing what J.P. Morgan is doing right now, holding massive amounts of physical, 800 million ounces, to what the Hunt Brothers did back in 1980, but they only held about 100 million ounces. Um, was it illegal? No. It's not illegal to hold... 800 million ounces of physical silver. Is it illegal to collude and naked short or even short the kind of volumes of shorting on the COMEX to keep the price low though, so that they can accumulate that amount of silver? Yes, that is influencing the price of silver. Is There should be position limits, but there isn't. There's all kinds of problems. And the CFTC is not going to change any of the rules until the unbacked fiat system crashes and goes away. And then everything changes and the whole world changes. And that's where we're getting to. And we're getting close. So it's it's important to understand the history of the Hunt Brothers. If you're going to invest in silver today, there's a great article on it. <clears throat> it came out in 2010 called Hunt Brothers Demand Physical Delivery 2. Uh, this is from the Monetary Future, uh, the Monetary Future blogspot.com. Anyway, a uh, billion dollars isn't what it used to be. Bunker Hunt on Sunday after Black Thursday when confronted with a significant payment demand from Engelhard. If you want to know what happens when multiple long positions demand physical delivery of a commodity all at once, you need you need look no further than the Hunt Brothers saga of 1979 to 1980. They did nothing illegal. You got that? The Hunt Brothers did nothing illegal. The Chicago Board of Trade, the CBOT, and the Comics, at the time they were private institutions owned and controlled. When you owned a seat on the CBOT or the Comics, you were the owner of the Comics or the CBOT. Now they're uh, owned by, uh, what is it, um, that big, gigantic monster or ice uh, conglomerate. Um, publicly owned, but now that but back then they were not. So basically, they were colluding. Obviously, they were the big, uh, you know, classic banksters smoking the cigars in the back rooms. Um, anyway, the the CBOT and the Comex changed the rules in the middle of the game. The Commodities Futures Trading Commission, the CFTC, implemented new regulations, and the hunts were bankrupt unjustly. Absolutely, the CFTC colludes with the market riggers and the exchanges. 100%. All they did really was simply request the delivery of physical metal for which they held valid legal contracts. The shorts were unable to meet the delivery price delivery at any price because enough deliverable silver did not exist. A classic short squeeze and the panic was on. This is their story in conjunction with wealthy investment partners from Saudi Arabia, the Hunt brothers, Bunker and Herbert initially amassed a legendary silver hoard that had supported itself with ever-increasing prices, propelled along the way by their continued margin buying on the exchanges. Beginning in 1973 and continuing through 1974, they slowly began purchasing future, silver futures contracts totaling 55 million ounces and took, then took physical delivery of all contracts. See, that's perfectly legal. They're buying the futures and then they're getting it delivered. Whereas what JP Morgan is doing is selling the futures and getting it delivered and delivering and getting physical silver anywhere they can on the COMEX as well as through the mint, through the uh, ETFs, everywhere. But they're shorting the physical to keep the price down so they can pull off this scam. Now the question is, can they get out of their short position? And I think there's enough stupid bankers out there to take the other end of that trade. Uh, since Bunker was concerned with in, uh, impending inflation and potential confiscation of precious metals, following Nixon's closing of the gold window, he arranged for transfer of the bullion to Switzerland. So it goes through more of the... You can, you can check this out. Let's just get into the, the nitty-gritty stuff. Um, the Arabian Connection. In 1978, a significant development occurred. John Connolly, former governor of Texas... He was the guy in... Uh, in JFK's car, too, wasn't he? Introduced Bunker to a Saudi sheikh at the Mayflower Hotel in Washington. Sheikh 
Khalid bin Mufaz was staying at the same hotel as Bunker and John Connolly. They met in bin Mufaz's suite, which consisted of the entire hotel floor complete with 30 or 40 security guards. The goal was to get the hunts in the front door with these wealthy Arab sheiks and the hunts would sell the Saudis on the value of silver over the worthless U.S. dollar with the hope of enlisting them for coordinated joint purchases. Now, then there's that's part of their problem. They're trying to take on the U.S. Treasury. <laughs> and they want the U.S. Treasury and the Fed want to print as much money as possible. And you can't do that with rising gold and silver prices. So you're going up against, you know, it's the U.S. against the two rich Hunt brothers. Uh, Mufaz became intrigued, but since he had close ties to the Saudi royal family, uh, and since the plan involved the potential elevation of silver to reserve asset status within the Saudi Arabian Monetary Authority, Bin Mufaz wished to be discreet. The operation was to be organized so that his name would not appear in public. Then on July 15, 1979, the company was formally established in Bermuda and registered under the name International Metals Investment Company, or IMIC for short. The, the stated object was dealing in precious metals, and its shares were divided equally between Nelson Hunt, Herbert Hunt, and the two designated Saudi Arabian money men. Um, the primary silver accumulation would occur through IMIC vehicle and two other well-connected middlemen, the Lebanese Niji Haz and Palestinian Mohammad Fustak. So they started accumulating the physical, physical on a larger scale. August 1st, 1979, a new name showed up on the Comex CFTC daily reports of silver purchasers. The buyer was IMIC through an account at Merrill Lynch's Dallas office opened by Herbert Hunt just seven days earlier. Other buying syndicates include Nahaj Nahaz and Bank Populaire Suisse with big money behind them entered the silver market at the end of the first week in August without being noticed. In all, during that period, over 43 million ounces of silver contracts were purchased through the Comex and the CBOT with delivery to be taken that fall. In the fall of 1979, the silver price doubled from $8 to $16 in only two months, and the Comex and the CBOT started to panic. The warehouses of the two exchanges only held 120 million ounces of silver, and that amount was traded in October alone. Many buyers, including the Hunts, through their IMIC, were taking delivery on their contracts. As disorienting as the price escalation was, even more of a concern was the exact identity of IMIC since the CFTC only had a post office box number located in Hamilton, Bermuda. See, the hunts, they were probably trying to take out the bad guys with the making system, but, uh, you know, they, they, it's one of those things. You can't, you can't uh, fight City Hall when it comes to running the monetary system because they control you. They own you. And here's what happened. In early January, it became evident that Comex intended to change the rules of the game. Then finally, on January 7th, in, well, in early, and in early January, it became evident. And then like that week, <laughs> on January 7th, 1980, the Comex changed their rules to only allow 10 million ounces of contracts per trader. And at all contracts over that amount must be 10 million ounce contracts must be liquidated before February 18th. So basically they said, all right, Hunt Brothers, we're going to take you out. And not only that, you're going to have to liquidate all your contracts. <laughs> of course, the CFDC promptly backed up the ruling. The escape hatch for the Hunts and some of their large longs was simply to convert their futures contracts into physicals, lease the physicals abroad at interest rates, which were tax deductions, and shift their future forward buying to the London Metal Exchange. On January 17th, silver hit $50. Bunker had continued to buy. At that point in time, the Hunt's silver position was worth $4.5 billion. And back in 1980, that was a lot of money. I mean, it's still now, but I mean, now what is it? That would be like $50 billion. Bringing their profits in silver to $3.5 billion. That's going to pale in comparison to what J.P. Morgan's going to get. Remember, J.P. Morgan makes $800 million, $800 million every year. One ounce silver goes up in price. Silver goes to fifty dollars. What is that? Uh, it's an extra thirty-five dollars. That's three point five billion dollars right there. 
That they would match the Hunt brothers. If silver goes up to fifty dollars, J.P. Morgan would match the Hunt brothers' gains of three point five billion. Is that right? No, it's thirty five. Hold on, <laughs> thirty five times. Yes, thirty. It's about thirty billion. It would blow out the Hunt brothers. Anyway, the chart below illustrates. Wait a minute, what is it? Forty billion, right? 35, hold on. Higher mathematics. Let's just say JP Morgan has 800 million ounces. $28 billion. So the Hunt Brothers only had 3.5, but if uh, silver goes up to 50 bucks, JP Morgan has 28 billion. Billion. <laughs> it's insane what's being allowed to happen. Chart below illustrates the Great Silver Spike of 1980. On January 1st, the COMEX announced that it was suspending trading in silver. Now, this is really interesting. So the China Screw Room, on January 21st, the COMEX announced that it was suspending trading in silver and that they would only accept liquidation orders. Now, that is not suspending trading. That means you're going to artificially suppress the price. We're suspending trading in silver, but they're only allowing liquidation orders. So there's no trading, but if you're going to liquidate everything, it's allowed. It's ridiculous. Predictably, with trading suspended and only liquidation orders going through, the price of silver dropped $10 an ounce and stayed at $39 an ounce until the end of January, which is like 10 days. Long lines formed outside of metal dealer shops and scrap silver, old silver coin collectors, and family silverware came into the market, about 22 million ounces in all. In early February, the Hunt Group took delivery of another 26 million ounces from Chicago. The Hunt's North Sea oil through Placid Oil was coming in online and generating 200 million a year from that venture alone. There was talk of a takeover of Texaco Oil. Bunker also talking to Middle Eastern rulers about putting together another silver buying group. Forever the optimist Bunker faithfully believed that he could maintain the silver spike if only he had cooperation, cooperative fresh buying. So they're colluding together, much like uh, our friends uh, J.P. Morgan does. By March 14th, uh, silver was down to $21 an ounce. Paul Volcker had raised interest rates and the dollar had firmed up. No, Paul Volcker implemented Alan Greenspan's trading programs to a higher degree. International Metals still held 60 million ounces of future contract. Their margin calls on those contracts amounted to $10 million a day. Bunker still believed that the price would go up higher. Uh, the, Hunt, the Hunt's brokerage connection in New York and London, uh, Bosch, Hazley Stewart Shields sent the Hunts a margin call for $100 million on March 26, 1980. Since the Hunts had also purchased vast quantities of Bosch stock, they were technically insiders required to adhere to all the rules of only fractional stock selling permitted on a monthly basis. With their Bosch stock illiquid and silver in a free fall, the Hunt brothers had run out of cash. Bunker was in Paris that day, so he called Hub Herbert and simply said, shut it down. Herbert promptly told his broker the following morning that they could not meet their total $135 million margin call. The Hunt brothers immediately sold $100 million worth of silver on that day. Their account only had $90 million worth of equity, and they were expected to lose all that the next day. The CFTC chairman and Federal Reserve and the Treasury Secretary began an around-the-clock silver monitoring session. They were in on the takedown anyway. It, I mean, it's not it, it doesn't start that day. Whoever... Whoever could have foreseen the day when a change in the price of silver would cause tremors throughout the entire stock market and adversely affect the reputations of leading brokerage and commodity firms. Wall Street was on the edge. Then we hit silver Thursday. March 27th, silver opened at $15.80 and closed at $10.80. Stock market crashed on rumors of the Hunt Brothers' liquidations of stock in order to cover his silver losses, but the market then rallied to close roughly at the same level. The Hunt's Bullion purchases were averaged around ten dollars an ounce, but their fortunes, their futures contracts were purchased at or about thirty-five dollars an ounce. When it was all over, the hunts owed approximately one point five billion dollars. 
Fearing a financial disaster, Federal Reserve Chairman Paul Volcker gave approval for an emergency bailout plan for the brothers and a group of banks agreed to loan the brothers $1.1 billion with the family posting $8 billion in collateral. Basically, they were taken out. Poor Nelson and Bunker Hunt. Um, moral of the story. If you're going to play in their game, meaning futures, options, COMEX, LBMA, um, you're going to, you got to expect them to lie, cheat, and steal. And that's what they do every day. So, yeah. So what's going to happen in the future? Is JP Morgan going to get the same treatment on, except in the opposite way with their massive short position in silver shorts? Probably not, since they're working for the federal government. They even claimed in a lawsuit that, that they can't be sued because they are uh, working in in concert with the federal government. So that was the, the Blanchard lawsuit way back when. So yeah, the game is rigged and there's nothing you can do about it. But the day the rigging stops is the day that silver hits moonshot and that's the day we've all been waiting for. Silver owners know a lot more about hodling than the crypto owners. <laughs> it's sad but true. But we, we're all hodling for the same reason. For free market, free markets to be uh, implemented in uh, the United States and around the world when it comes to um, silver and when it comes to cryptos. Massive manipulation in cryptos, massive manipulation in silver. Ultimately, the manipulation will fall away and the, only the hodlers will be the one. The people holding it in their own possession will be the, the benefactors of that. Um, so we'll see how quickly this spreads and how fast it goes. Ted Butler's extremely bullish on silver right now. Silver's like at $15. Uh, he thinks there's going to be a quick run up to 50 and then who knows what's going to happen. So keep your hats on. Hang in there. Uh, you want to know more about the Hunt Brothers. I have written extensively about them at RoadToRua.com. Just do a search for Hunt Brothers right here. It's, there's 90 articles that mention the Hunt Brothers. So check it all out. There's a lot of great silver stuff. And if you, if you guys haven't... Uh, Traveled around the Road to Ruta website, uh, a lot of written articles. This is, you know, these are the days before I was doing YouTube stuff. Uh, thousands, so I think there's three over three thousand articles now, and a lot of it pertains to exactly what's going on right now with J.P. Morgan's uh, silver manipulation on the comics. Um, so check it out, and you guys have a good weekend. Give me a thumbs up if you like this. If you like more silver stuff, especially, give me a thumbs up. So I know there's a lot of uh, weary silver holders that are waiting for that day, and that day is coming. Um, it's not today, but uh, I'm hoping by the end of the year we'll see some real price discovery um, in the price of silver, which is well over $50. So let's see what happens. I'll talk to you guys later.